All right, so it is 7.33 p.m. on Thursday, October 28th, 2021. Uh, good evening, my name is Christian Klein. I'm the chair of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. I'm calling this meeting of the board to order. I'd like to confirm that all members and anticipated officials are present. Uh, members of the Zoning Board of Appeals, uh, Roger DuPont. Here. Uh, Patrick Hanlon. Here. Kevin Mills. Here. Aaron Ford. Here. Stephen Revlock. Here. Sean O'Rourke. Here. Thank you all. Um, and Rick Valerelli is here. Good evening, and I know Vin Lee is occupied, so he will not be joining us this evening. And uh, Paul Haverty. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Good evening. How are you? Good. I, I don't seem to have an option to turn my computer up to my video on for some reason. Nah. Rick, is that something we can fix for Paul? I'm going to work on that. Uh, Paul, sit tight. But we can hear you loud and clear. Okay. I'm not really all that concerned about it. Okay. <laughs> Um, question that also means you can't share your screen. Yeah, that's so actually I'm not really very problem. capable of that anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> All, right. All right. Well, let me bring, well, I'm getting that to launch. I'll go ahead. Um, so this open meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted remotely, consistent with an act extending certain COVID-19 measures adopted during the state of emergency signed into law on June 16th, 2021. This act includes an extension until April 1st, 2022 of the remote meeting provisions of the Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, which suspended the requirement to hold all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed to continue to participate remotely. Public bodies may meet remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. For this meeting, the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals has convened a video webinar via the Zoom webinar app with online and telephone access as listed on the agenda posted to the town's website, identifying how the public may join. This meeting is being recorded and it will be broadcast by ACMI. All supporting materials that have been provided members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted. And the public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda. So we'll start this evening with the comprehensive permit for Thorndike Place. Uh, at the end of its October 20th, 2022 public hearing, the board voted unanimously to close the public hearing for Thorndike Place. This marked the end of the acceptance of testimony and new information in regards to the project. It also initiated a 40 day period for the board to consider and render a decision. Tonight's discussions and deliberations are being held openly and publicly but the board is unable to accept further comment from the applicant, the board's peer review consultants, the town or the public. For this reason, tonight's meeting is being conducted using the webinar platform, which allows the board to limit who may participate in the discussion. On behalf of the board, I appreciate everyone's understanding. As we have presented in the past, the board has three decisions available to it under state statute, approval without condition, approval with conditions or a denial. These three options remain available to the board throughout the deliberation. While the deliberation is based <clears throat> around a draft decision, considering an approval with conditions, discussion of this draft should not be taken to assume that the other options are no longer being considered. At the end of the deliberation, the members of the board will need to decide for themselves the best way to address the local needs of the neighborhood and the town. At its October 5th, 2021 public hearing, the board and the applicant agreed to work towards voting on a final decision no later than November 23rd, 2021. While the 40 day period for deliberation officially ends on November 30th, 2021, as the official vote to close the public hearing occurred in the early hours of October 21st, there are several holidays that make meeting after the 23rd difficult. I'd like to begin this evening by discussing the schedule for future deliberative sessions in regards to the draft decision. And we'll then discuss strategies for how to discuss the draft decision before starting our official deliberations. And at the end of tonight's meeting, the board may either vote on the final decision or vote to continue the meeting to continue its deliberations. As stated before, by negotiation with the applicant, the board is working towards issuing a decision 
no later than November 23rd, but it must issue a decision by November 30th under state law or request an extension of the applicant to further continuous deliberations. Uh, so let me quickly bring up schedule document. So tonight is Thursday, October 28th. Um, <clears throat> it's the start of the open deliberation period. Um, so the two meetings that we currently have scheduled, one is Tuesday, November 9th at 7.30, uh, which is a new hearing for 31 Melvin Road and will also be the continuance of 125, 127 Webster Street. We could use that um, evening as well for Thorndike Place. Um, the trick would be we would essentially need to hold two hearings on that same night. We'd have one hearing where we would do Melvin Road and Webster Street, and then we would close that hearing, and then we would reopen in webinar to do the deliberations on Thorndike Place. But we could certainly do that on the 9th. Um, and then the 23rd, um, because of scheduling, we really couldn't put it much, long, much later. We have about four new hearings already on for the 23rd. Because and then the week after is the week of Hanukkah. It comes very early this year. So um, what I'd like to do is see if we can find dates the week of November second and November sixteenth that work for everyone, where we could um, try to get meetings in. And I think if we can do that, we'll be able to close um, the week of the sixteenth. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Hanlon, um, are we going to try to? focus on Tuesdays and Thursdays? Um, I would like to, but certainly other dates are, are in the cards if that's easier. So I know that Tuesday the second is technically election day, but there are no elections in the town of Arlington so that we can still meet on that evening. Um, I'm, I'm unavailable on the second, sorry. Okay. How do we, is the fourth a possibility? Either the third or the, the fourth is Thursday and the third is Wednesday. Correct. And it would be nice to meet once th that week if we can. Absolutely. So usually Paul's schedule is the hardest one. I am not available on the fourth. I am available on the third. Okay. Everyone else available on the third? I would be. Yes. 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 Perfect. Yes. Okay, so we will use the third. And then would we prefer to try to meet later on the ninth or would we prefer to try for a different day that week or what, what seems better for people? I am available on the 9th, Mr. Chairman. I'm assuming if we start with 7.30 with the other two hearings, Melvin Road, I think is probably, Mr. Valerelli, what's the, what's Melvin Road about, do you recall? A, a large addition, Mr. Chairman. It's a large addition. Now Webster Street's gonna be a little complicated. So we starting at 7.30 for those, we probably be starting deliberations at nine. I'd what rather move it to another day personally then. Are the 10th or the 11th possibilities for people? I am not available on the 10th, I am available on the 11th. How people feel about meeting on the 11th? Mr. Mills is a thumbs up. I'm fine. Okay. Yep. And then should it be necessary the week of the 16th? Available the 15th and the 16th. Okay. The 
does the 16th work for people? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sixteen can take this off. All right. So we'll meet next week on the third. On Thorndike Place will be the following week on the eleventh. And the week thereafter on the sixteenth. And hopefully on the sixteenth we'll be able to finish things up. All right. Go ahead and stop sharing on that. Um, and then I need to find. Vision review copy. Oops. Okay. So this is the draft decision from um, October 13. Um, it may look slightly different if the word, it's the uh, copy is converted uh, back into Word. Um, <clears throat> so at the hearing on Tuesday, um, Pat had a couple of uh, good recommendations about how we might want to proceed this evening. Um, and I believe the recommendation was to start with the, start from the waiver end and work our way through those and then double back. Is that correct, Pat? Yeah, to work through that. And I I would do it through waivers first and then conditions and then go back to the findings last. That's partly due to the fact that it's easy to get bogged down in wordsmithing on findings and the conditions are usually more discreet. Mm -hmm. And as Mr. Revelak pointed out, they're the ones that are binding. And so consequently, they're the legal drafting. Um, I personally have got some thoughts as to how we might make the uh, findings explain better what the rationale of the decision is in a way that's somewhat more transparent. Um, and that would, that again, takes time because that's not just fiddling with one paragraph uh, uh, rather than another. Uh, so I certainly would like to be able to move that in towards the end rather than try to deal with it on the fly um, at the beginning. So I'd start with the waivers because I think those are the clearest uh, and then go to the conditions and do the findings last. Sound fine to everyone? Yeah. <clears throat> Mr. Mr. Chairman? Yes, please. Uh, so I have a couple of process questions and I think these are probably for Mr. Haverty. But I wanted to know that during the period of our deliberation, are we able to consult with him, town council, and attorney Witten, should we so desire? Paul, do you want to address that? Okay, that you are able to consult with town council and with special town council during the deliberation process. I've never heard of any suggestion to the council. Okay. And then the, consult the other, with them, then you wouldn't be allowed to consult with me during this process either. So we, we should be able to. I think that you would be allowed to, yes. Yes. And then the other question I have, and I, I think it's already been addressed, is um, you know, if we're working backwards and we go to waivers and then we go to conditions, we're not actually going to vote on those. We're just sort of discussing how they might be worded or what the actual 
language should be or what the intent of those particular paragraphs are. We're not going to vote. My, my concern is we're not going to vote on those after we're done with that particular section so that we're really reserving our final decision until the very end of the process, as I understand it. That is correct. Yeah, they'll just be the, the one vote at the end. Okay. All right. That's all. Thanks. Okay. All right. So with that, um, so the, the first couple of these, I think, are fairly straightforward because I don't think there's any disagreement. Um, so the first waiver. Actually, Mr. Chair? Yes, Mr. Revelack. Uh, sorry to sorry to jump in, but um, yeah. as I was reviewing my notes from some of the hearings, um, I recall a number of public commenters expressing a preference that the board us uh, deny the application, and they would uh, seem to want to do sort of um, prefer to go the appeal route if necessary mm -hmm. without expressing an opinion one way or the other. I wanted to see to just ask my colleagues how they uh, felt about that request. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Um, there, there, as the chair stated earlier, it's, there, there'll be a time uh, when we're going to have a motion at the end. Mm -hmm. um, presumably, uh, I'm, I'm assuming that during the course of the discussion, the changes that are made to a draft opinion will be taken as the, the thing that we'd vote for if we were voting for adopting an opinion with conditions. Um, but that still leaves the possibility of just denying it altogether. Uh, and there, there are a couple of ways of doing that. One is to vote on the opinion and, and, and decision. And if that fails to get a suitable majority, then that acts as a, uh, as a denial, although it would probably be better, I think, to, to move denial or a motion to just say, I move to deny the application completely. Um, could be made before we get to the opinion. Uh, that would basically be saying, as good as we've been able to make the draft decision, uh, we still don't think it passes muster, and we think that that uh, we should deny it. Uh, that would enable everybody to go on record if that's what they want to do, on whether uh, and whether to just outright deny it. Uh, and if that motion passes, it passes. If the motion fails, then we would go presumably to a motion to approve the decision before us. Right. That, I, I think that makes sense, res reserving it until later. Okay. And Mr. Chairman, may I just have a point of clarity on that? Yes, please. Um, it, it, the, the point was said that if we were to just deny and so the neighbors could exercise their appeal rights, it's my understanding that if we deny this petition, that got appeal rights. no appeal rights, that the applicant can go to the Housing Appeals Committee and try and to their original application of over 200 units and the neighbors cannot do anything about that they because they can only appeal our decision to approve or approve with conditions is that correct that is correct mr o'rourke there is no standing for any party other than the applicants to file an appeal if the board issues a denial um, in that instance they wouldn't have any right to intervene in an appeal to the Housing Appeals Committee, they wouldn't have the right to file a separate appeal to the land court or the superior court. They would be left with in a position of having to rely upon the board to defend its own decision. Mr. Chairman, um, suppose if, if the, I'm assuming the, uh, how does it actually work? work if this actually goes to court? I mean, at the outset, of it, to the extent to which our, our opinion wouldn't aggrieve somebody who wants us to deny it, it would be doing what they want. So presumably, they wouldn't have the ability to appeal that. And they can't intervene before the, the HAC. So if HEC basically agrees with the applicant or comes out with a favorable decision from the applicant's point of view, 
what recourse then would the uh, would the residents or the the uh, uh, people who oppose this to be what would be their recourse in court at that point they would be aggrieved by whatever the decision of hack was if it favored the applicant Right. The theoretically, they could attempt to file a Chapter 30A appeal of the Housing Appeals Committee decision. There would be a question as to whether or not they have a right to file that appeal since they weren't a party to the original proceeding. Um, there is some discretion in the Superior Court to allow a, a party to intervene into an appeal. Um, you know, if, if they are going from a non-aggrieved status to an aggrieved status, which would be the case if the Housing Appeals Committee overturns a denial in issues and approval based upon whatever project the, the applicant decides to pursue at the Housing Appeals Committee. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Other questions along these lines? Okay. All right. Um, then with that, Um, <clears throat> so turning back to the draft decision and the waivers, um, so the first was a request uh, for a waiver from Title Three, Article One, Sections One and Two, use of streets for construction of demolition materials, um, and this was requires a permit from the Board of Public Works or the town engineer, including a bond requirement for work adjacent to public ways and for the use of public ways to place building materials and or rubbish. Applicant requests a waiver except for the bonding requirements. Um, <clears throat> so my understanding of this, uh, the waiver is being denied. The applicant requested a waiver of the procedural requirements of the section and a waiver that's unnecessary for comprehensive permit application as all of their local approval processes are subsumed into the comprehensive permit application, the applicant has not set forth any substantive waiver requests of this section. Therefore, no waivers are granted. And there has not, I have not seen enough. Um, the applicant did not request that that be waived, or did not, sorry, object to that interpretation. Um, and there was no further comment from our, uh, from Beta, so I think that one Unless there's any questions, I think we're fine there. Um, number two was uh, right the title, excuse me, Title V, Article 8 of the Town Wetlands Protection Law, requesting a waiver of procedural jurisdictional requirements, applications, fees, costs, regulations, et cetera. And similar to the first one, um, the recommendation is to deny the waiver, deny the waiver. Constitutes a request for a waiver from the procedural requirements under the wetlands bylaw. Request is denied as unnecessary as the procedural requirements of other local permitting processes are assumed into this comprehensive permit process. To the extent that this waiver seeks uh, substantive waivers, such as jurisdictional requirements, policies, et cetera, the waiver request is overly broad and is therefore denied. And again, that was um, in the comments that were submitted by applicant, they did not uh, press that one. Number three, um, in wetlands protection, section two, uh, area subject to jurisdiction. Okay, we, um, applicant requests a waiver. These sections waive the area adjacent to upland resource area as resource areas to allow portions of the ore to be graded completed as compensatory flood storage and or emergency access areas as shown in the approved plans. Um, so this one, they would need a waiver in order to complete the project. Um, and the recommended action was to allow the grant, to allow the waiver to allow work within the aura as shown on the plans, but to waive the aura as a resource area in general would be denied. So this would basically just allow them to work in the limited areas of the or I believe there's a small portion at the rear of the building um, where the pathway goes around the back for emergency access and then the location of the compensatory flood storage. That's what this would allow. 
Um, and there was no, the applicant had not um, issued any statement in regards to that one. Uh, number four, Town of Arlington Development Regulations, vegetation and removal and replacement requires an application process in which the applicant must list all species existing and all proposed replacements, including specific requirements for deciduous trees, evergreens, and shrubs. Um, so the waiver, the applicant has requested that this waiver be granted um, and the, our, uh, the, excuse me, the Conservation Commission and uh, Beta have recommended that it not be allowed. Um, to, and the description would be the waiver was denied is unnecessary. Project is providing habitat restoration in the location of the two to one floodplain compensation area and will also be providing habitat restoration of the rear acreage that will remain undeveloped. Such restoration efforts should follow the guidance provided by the regulations of section 24. And then there was additional language that was also provided by the Conservation Commission. Um, so they had an extended version of that, which would be the waiver is denied project providing habitat restoration, the relocation of two to one floodplain compensatory storage, excuse me, floodplain compensation area, and also some grading revegetation of the outer aura. Such restoration and revegetation efforts should follow the guidance provided by the regulations in section 24 for protection of resource areas, establishment of a healthy diversified native plant community within the two to one floodplain compensation area will provide a resilient habitat in a resource area that protects the interests it must replicate, including protection of flood control, groundwater, and wildlife habitat. The guidance found in Section 24 of vegetation removal and replacement is critical to the long-term success of this mitigation area, whereby providing important public benefit. <clears throat> so in regards to this waiver, um, that which I just read, which is the, the recommendation from the uh, Conservation Commission in their October 14 uh, letter to the board. Mr. Chairman? Hanlon. Um, I wondered if Mr. Haverty could comment a little bit. My, I, I was going along with the ACC fine for a while, but then we got, it got to be pretty long and much of it of the discussion didn't seem that it seemed to be a general, more general than necessary to support the, um, to support the denial of the waiver. And I wonder if it would be appropriate to do some of that and not all of it. Unfortunately, we don't have that language exactly in front of it, me and I can't keep it in my head as just to remember it. I'm trying to find where it is in the October 14th letter, but it's hard to it's hard to do that. Yeah, let me see if I can bring it up. I believe it's page two of the letter going into page three. I mean, I'm sorry, page one. Right. I got it. This text hearing. Okay, having, I mean, I, having read it, it doesn't seem nearly as long reading it as it does hearing it. And <laughs> it looks all right to me. I, mean, I think it does a very good job of explaining specifically why we are denying this. Um, do, we, do we move to sec accept certain language? Is that how we proceed, uh, Mr. Chair? Um, so typically what we, I think what we had done last Ooh. time was if there were, you know, we just sort of, we would present it and ask if there's any questions or comments. And then we sort of decide if this is what we're gonna keep or if we're gonna move or if we wanna go with a different version. 
So I think I would ask, if, is there any objection to maintain, to going with the language provided by the Conservation Commission in regards to waiver four? No objection. All right. Move on to number five. This is in regards to section 25, adjacent resource areas. Um, this is similar to number, this was number four, where the waiver is granted to allow work within the aura as shown in the approved plan, but the request to waive the aura as a resource area in general is denied. Sorry, Mr. Chairman. Yes, please. I, I was trying to get to my button here to yeah. what I was. I was actually reading my copy of the language that we had up before. In in this one, doesn't the um, doesn't <laughs> Oh, you're back on mute, Roger. Uh, there we go. Sorry, sorry about that. So, so didn't it say though in the language that prior to what we're seeing now that it was saying it was denied as unnecessary? So, in their October fourteen letter, um, they had their recommendation was to repeat the same response as waiver number three, which is waiver granted to, work, to allow work within the aura as shown on the approved plans request to waive or as a resource area in general is denied. Okay, so we're not, we're not framing it in terms of being denied as unnecessary then, if we accept this language. That's correct, because I think this is not actually a procedural matter. Okay. I just wanted to clarify because one said okay. unnecessary and the other did not. So I'm okay. fine. Thank you. Are there any objections to five? Seeing none. Um, it, I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Nope. Chair. You mean number five using the ACC language? Using the ACC language, yes. Okay. Okay, so this brings us to number six. Um, so this is the bond question. Um, so the recommendation for the Conservation Commission is to reject the, is to deny the waiver. Um, so the and we had some discussion in regards to this at the at the prior hearing with the applicant in terms of what was appropriate. Um, and I know they were very opposed at the start, but it sounded towards the end like they were not completely as opposed as they were initially. So in the September 20th memo from Beta Group, they they had a memo and then they had um, uh, documentation supporting it. So the the value here, the $173,900 is the approximate replacement cost for all the vegetation on the property, um, which is how we had arrived at a figure for 1165R Mass Ave. They had done the, the same uh, calculations just there. It was a significantly smaller um, impact area, whereas here it's, it's much more considerable. So. Uh, that's where that value comes from. Um, so we cannot, if we can maintain that amount. We can choose a smaller amount. We just, whatever number we provide, we just need to make sure that we can justify it. Um, so here's what people think on this point. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Um, it seems to me that I, I would go with the language that the Conservation Commission has. Uh, I think that the explanation that this is just a very different project from 1165R uh, is, is persuasive. There's much more work that needs to be done. And we have a justification of the amount that is proposed by the ACC. Um, we, could, we could go higher or lower, but 
uh, I don't have any basis, at least in, in what I know, to pick any other number uh, than that one. It would just be an arbitrary compromise of some kind. Um, so I would I would propose uh, accepting the ACC's language here. I still feel comfortable with that. Do we need any additional explanation as to why that number, or is just referencing the memo from beta group sufficient? Mr. Chair, uh, I had a question. The, the language from the ACC October 14th memo doesn't state the number. Correct. Something. It just says to follow beta's recommendation. So would we be adopting the language in paragraph six of the decision as we look at it with the number or uh, the language that um, the ACC has in number six or a combination of the two? So that the figure comes from a September 20th right. memo from Beta Group, which I'm seeking out here. Do you know if there was a reason that the ACC left out the number and just said as requested by Beta? Um, the only reason I can think of is that it was act, it was Beta who had put forward the figure. Um, Mr. Chairman. Yes, please. Uh, we should we should keep in mind that the language that appears in the October 14th letter is not necessarily intended to be language actually used in the decision. That is really up to us. But in each case, uh, the form of the ACC's letter is to make a recommendation and then to state its own justification to us as to why it is uh, we should adopt its, um, its, its recommendation. Um, I think it is helpful to use their justification where we agree with it uh, as part of the explanation. But here, uh, when the ACC is agreeing with Beta's recommendation, I think that that, to me at least, that implies a uh, agreement with their calculation as to what is required. And as I remember from the hearing last week, or the, was last, last week, um, uh, Ms. Chapnick did not present, did, did not di dissent for that or suggest that some other number was appropriate. In fact, she sort of, as I recall, emphasized that the adjustment reduced uh, the estimate considerably and was another reason why it should be uh, thought of as reasonable. The, on the screen, so this is the memo that was prepared um, Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to remember the reasoning behind the adjusted estimate. I meant to highlight that before I brought this up. Oh, here, yeah. So the for the woodland restoration areas, assume the entire restoration area will not be cleared and grubbed for invasive species management. Therefore, the number of plants will not be as high as calculated. In addition, it's assumed that not all vegetation will need to be replaced based on the assumption the cost of plantings was divided by four. And similarly, they divided in the uh, compensatory storage area by two, um, which is how they arrived with that figure of $173,900. Mr. Chairman? Mr. Hanlon. As, as a way of dealing with this, I wonder whether we could um, tentatively approve this at the 173,900 level mm -hmm. and then take op an opportunity of the next couple of days to refer back to the hearing and for this discussion to see if there's anything there that would lead us uh, to either make that higher or lower or take some other uh, or, or leave it indefinite. Uh, at, at this point, we have, you know, sort of 
the number that beta has and a general sense that the ACC agreed with it. Um, but but there's uh, unless somebody can remember exactly what was said, the best way to go about resolving that is to go back and look at it. And Mr. Chairman, I agree with Mr. Hamlet, maybe adding that language from um, the ACC number justification. Put a note in there to return it next session on that one. Okay, Mr. Chairman, if, if I'm willing to volunteer to look at it, if I mean everybody who wants to can, but I will make sure I do so that I can have it in my mind next time. I'll see that as it's all right. Um, number seven. Um, this. The wetland consultants fees. So again, this is one where um, the applicant is looking for us to waive. Um, we had approved funds for this at on 1165 of RMS Ave um, for these reviews. Um, so you can see the strikeout was the request, um, and then. I can spell commission. Oops. Um, commission needs to retain the funds for potential peer review needs due to the complexity of the project, the uncertainty in several aspects of the proposal, including uncertainty in groundwater elevations. Um, so this funds applies to the town bylaw. Stuff that falls under the town bylaw only does not include funds for reviews that would come under the state wetlands bylaw. The state wetlands bylaw, they can apply for independent 53G funds for that. Um, and so this is to support the review of work under the conditions. Um, and it basically is to support, if they, need, if they need to hire a consultant to assist them in the review of the materials that are, um, that they'll be assisting in the review of. Uh, Mr. Chairman? Yes, please. Um, my notes actually have in the side, Haverty has language on this. Ah. Um, and so while he looks, <laughs> while he looks stunned, let me just, <laughs> let me just, you know, the key thing that is what the chair just said that, that we can't pre prescribe, uh, funds for them to implement the, the state act, uh, that there's another procedure for that, but there are conditions that are being imposed here in lieu of what the, board would, uh, in lieu of what the Conservation Commission would do if it were in the ordinary course establishing conditions under here. And my understanding was that the justification of this is that uh, this is a fairly complex thing and they may need uh, funds for help in assessing the way in which the, um, these, were, uh, these were carried out. When we dealt with this under 1165R, um, we also had language that Mr. Haverty suggested, uh, mentioning that the board that the town would was expected normally to provide its own uh, expertise here, and that this is for uh, work that is beyond what is is within the capability of the town. Um, but in any event, the Conservation Commission here is looking towards consistency with the 1165R decision, and we dealt with this kind of question there. So that being said, I wonder if Mr. Haverty can comment on what the language is we should use here. Mr. Chairman, I, I don't actually see the need for this waiver at all, and I don't see the, the reason why it needs to be denied. The, the Conservation Commission has full authority to retain peer review consultants under the Wetlands Protection Act. They don't have any authority under the local bylaw to retain peer review consultants for this project because they're not reviewing this project under the local wetlands bylaw. Um, you have already retained uh, peer review consultants to review this proposal under the wetlands bylaw. You don't need to do any additional review once this hearing is closed, other than review of final plans, and there's authorization within the, the body of your decision for the retaining of peer review consultants to review the final plans. So 
So, I, I mean, I, I ultimately, I think this is a whole lot to do about nothing. I, I don't see this as a waiver that should have been even requested because mm -hmm. I don't think it, it's applicable. Oh, I see. So you would recommend the bylaw, you know, applies to wetlands consultant fees for the review of the application. Right. Once this decision has been issued, the review of the application is complete, and nobody is going to be doing any additional review of wetlands under the local wetlands bylaws. So there will be no need for consultant fees to undertake such review. But wouldn't there still be a requirement to review the final plans? There is still a requirement to review the final plans, and there is language in the, the body of the conditions that allows the board to retain peer review consultants, and as Mr. Hanlon noted, only to the extent that there is a lack of sufficient local expertise to actually review the plans themselves. But again, that we, you don't need to rely upon this particular um, section for that. It, ultimately, I think waiver denied is fine. Okay. I don't think you need to, to really include any language beyond that because at minimum, if you did get to a point of an argument you know, at a later time about the rights for the, the board, not the Conservation Commission, but the board, to impose consultant fees as they relate to the wetlands, you probably don't want to have waived this. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Hanlon, the excuse me the the explanation that's given by the Conservation Commission is that uh, what they're interested in is potential peer review and technical assistance needed during project construction because of the complexity of the project and uncertainties in some areas of the proposal, uh, including uncertainty in groundwater elevations through the site. Um, as I recall, what this was intended to be, to refer to was not technical assistance in the course of our coming to our decision, uh, but technical assistance in the course of enforcing our decision or ensuring compliance with the conditions that are otherwise going to be um, are, are otherwise going to be uh, uh, imposed. Um, it may very well be that that we ought to just punt on this, but I'd hate for the record to show. I'm not convinced that there's no occasion in which the board. I mean, ultimately, the issue here is whether, in reality, the conditions are being complied with and that that may involve technical expertise. I don't actually know exactly where we would go or who has the right to get that expertise. So maybe it would be better just to say denied and not to expand beyond that. But I, I wouldn't want the record to reflect that we all agreed that, th that no one was entitled to anything because we may need we may need to to work on this uh, uh, later on. So I guess at the end of the day, I'm happy with just saying denied, but leaving open that that there may be occasions where we may need to seek funds. Mr. Chair? Yes, sir. Um, if I may, I'd like to read uh, some of my notes from the uh, tw the hearing on October 20th where this was discussed. No, please. Uh, so for M Ms. Kiefer, I have her saying, uh, paraphrased, uh, for waiver number seven, Ms. Kiefer suggests the regulation was, an in was not intended to require continuous review. It's for reviewing the NOI and order of conditions under the State Wetlands Act. She suggests the board deny the waiver as, un as unnecessary. The Conserv Conservation Commission can request Chapter 53G funds when permitting under the State Wetlands Act. Susan Chapnick responded that she was okay with denying as unnecessary, provided that Ms. Kiefer's legal argument is correct. And then I have Mr. Haverty saying, Mr. Haverty states that Ms. Kiefer's legal argument is correct. The okay. comprehensive permit does not take away the Conservation Commission's ability to review the project under the State Wetlands Act. So that's what I have for waiver seven. Okay. <laughs> The waiver denied is unnecessary. And what was that last sentence you had there? That was helpful, I thought. Oh, you're, you're muted now, though. 
sorry about that. Uh, the last sentence I read was the comprehensive permit yeah. doesn't take away the Conservation Commission's ability to review the project under the State Wetlands Act. I'll clean that up. All right. Apart from my shorthand, does that sound fine to everyone? And I'll just fix that afterwards. Okay. Uh, number eight. We have moved beyond the Conservation Commission ones. Um, so, so the waiver is denied as on they this is about the exterior placement of dumpsters, and they're intending to put them on the inside. So we had said the waiver was denied as unnecessary. Um, I was going to propose adding to it, the dumpsters will be internal to the apartment building per the provided plans. Relocation of the dumpsters to an exterior location will be considered a substantial change requiring a public hearing. I think is fine and clear and hopefully is stuff we'll never need to worry about. So Mr. Chairman, the only thing I would say about that is you would still need to go through the process of making a determination Okay. Propose to move them to an outside location. Mm -hmm. You would still have to go through the process of actually formally declaring that the change is a substantial change that requires a public hearing. Okay. So should I? Do we need the second sentence, or is it just redundant? I I think my only concern is including it might leave you in a position where a request for a change comes in, mm -hmm. you don't act on it within your time frame. So I think I would delete it. Okay. Because if you if you don't act within the, I think it's 15 days uh, on the request for uh, modification, then it's automatically approved. Oh, I see, okay. So you, you don't wanna run into a situation where you think, well, this is, Obviously, you know, per the decision, it's a substantial change. Therefore, we're going to schedule a public hearing, which is 30 days oh. by that 15 day period. Yeah. Rather than run the risk of, of running into that circumstance, I think you're better off just leaving it silent. This way, you know, you have to go through the process of making the determination and scheduling the public hearing. Okay. Um, so, waiver number nine. Stormwater management. Um, the applicant had recommended it be waived. Stormwater will be managed in accordance with Mass Depth's stormwater policy and technical guidance, unless otherwise exempt. Stormwater will be managed in accordance with US EPA. Um, Mr. Chair? Yes, sir. I had a couple of questions about this. So I do understand that the section of the bylaw provides that the engineering division reviews mm -hmm. the stormwater systems. And I understand that what they're saying is that that's not going to be needed because it's gonna be done according to uh, DEP and EPA. Um, but who in fact is responsible for reviewing and approval that? I take it's the state and the federal government. So do we not have any part whatsoever to play in making sure that they are in fact conforming to those requirements? So that's a good question. I was gonna say locally, I mean, the applicant has, you know, done a stormwater design that has been reviewed by the peer review consultants. Um, and so we don't have any, there's there's not a stated concern that this, that there's an issue specifically with, this, with the stormwater system. Um, I was a little, I'm wondering if this is supposed to be waived, I mean, um, denied because it's a procedural and covered under the comprehensive permit. But I do appreciate your question about if this is under MassDEP and under US EPA, who is responsible for those? 
Well, Mr. Chairman, the, the Conservation Commission has jurisdiction to review and make determinations regarding compliance with the Mass EEP stormwater management policy as part of its process on the notice of intent. Okay. That's one of the determinations that they have to make as part of issuing an order of conditions. So that essentially that goes with, that goes without saying then essentially? Yep. And then I had another question and this is more informational. So if you're looking at the DEP stormwater policy and then the EPA stormwater, et cetera, if those are to be amended over time, whatever those policies are during the course of the construction, um, does the applicant then have to conform to the amended versions of these policies? It's difficult to answer that question without actually reviewing whatever the, the proposed change would be. Yeah, they, they may actually address that in terms of you know, whether it's applied prospectively or whether it's retroactively. Um, generally speaking, once they have an order of conditions, they're subject to whatever requirements were in place as of the date of the issuance of that order of conditions. On the federal level, um, it would probably be the same once they got the local approvals. Any changes to federal requirements wouldn't be applicable to the project. And, and just to understand the timeline a little bit better, so the issuance of the order of conditions from the Conservation Commission comes relatively soon after we were to, if we approved it with conditions. It doesn't have to. I mean, it's in the applicant's best interest. I mean, if they want to get to the point where they're able to pull a building permit for this, the sooner they get their order of conditions, the better off it is for them. Yeah. There's nothing that says they can't wait two years and file in. But should they, as long as they wait during that pendency, if the policies were to change either at the state or federal level, then if the orders of conditions haven't, haven't actually issued, then they would likely be subject to whatever any amendments would be? Correct. Okay. Right. The, the issuance of the comprehensive permit doesn't, as far as I'm aware, does not provide them any sort of protection as it relates to the state wetlands protection act um, or any federal requirements. They would have to have received approvals under those provisions in order to have. Thank you. So it sounds therefore that we would basically be saying waiver denied is unnecessary. Um, because all local permitting pr processes are subsumed into the comprehensive permit application, no waiver of this provision is required. Yeah. I, I don't know that we've been made aware of any substantive requirements of this provision that are being requested to be waived. So it does seem as though it's a procedural waiver. Yeah, because it's a section requires engineering division review and approval. That's all they're saying. So we can go and we can review what it actually says and determine if there's an issue. And the issuance of the comprehensive permit is the issuance of the local approval under this file. Correct. Okay, so I will I'll check on that before the next hearing. Um, number 10, uh, tree, protection, tree protection and preservation. Um, we were denied as unnecessary. And this, there was some question about what it required, but this is based on the 2016 bylaw, um, not the more recent bylaw. And I believe, uh, I think Steve, you, if your notes have this, uh, I believe every, at the end, everyone sort of agreed that this was fine. Yeah, so let's see. So wait, that is not waiver 10? And All right, it, I don't, uh, that one didn't come up on the 10th, but let's see. Okay. We'll see what, uh, let me do some skimming.
So on the applicant's copy of the draft markup from September 24, they had it in here as waiver denied as unnecessary. So I found it. Okay. We did talk about it on the 10th. It was just earlier. It kind of came up during public comment. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay. So, um, so this was in response to uh, Steve Moore. Yep. During the comment public comment period, raised the question um, about it. I wrote, he's concerned about covenants being, oh, regarding waiver 10, that means working with the tree warden and submitting a tree plan. Uh, and then I have Ms. Kiefer says the applicant agrees to work with the tree warden. The open space parcel was not a sudden change. The original plan was to convey it to a third party. Mm -hmm. There will be a conservation restriction. The parcel will be available for recreation and can be used by the public. Those are public benefits, which are desired by the town. There's also been he hesitancy part of the town. So basically, uh, so all, it looks like all I have is that the applicant, the applicant agreeing to work with the tree warden. Okay. Oh, and there's another, it does come up again. Uh, Susan Stamps. Yeah. Um, re regarding waiver 10, Ms. Stamps understands that the applicants have to comply with the 2016 version of the tree by law. Yep. She asks if the applicants will have to submit a tree plan showing the location of all trees that are located within the setback and have a diameter of at least 10 inches and re pay replanting fees. Uh, Ms. Kiefer says the applicants will present a tree plan. They're not required to have it approved because the comprehensive permit subsumes all others. Uh, and then a little later, Ms. Noyes says that they intend to comply with the ordinance, um, though she's not sure how un removal of unsafe trees will be counted. Okay. So if we deny the waivers unnecessary because the local permitting processes are subsumed, do the comprehensive permit application, does that get us into any issues with those statements? Could, because they have agreed to provide the plan. I, I think that this waiver decision should note that the tree plan shall be submitted as part of the final plan. Because I don't believe you've received it yet. Mr. Chairman, yep. to, just to, to underscore that, the, the uh, um, in order to figure out whether, you, the, regardless of whether the tree warden approves the tree plan or not, um, you need the tree plan in order to decide whether uh, the applicant is complying with the sub substantive provisions. So at some point there has to be an identification of the trees and what it is they have to pay for and what it is that they don't. Mm -hmm. And so it seems to me that that it's impossible really to divorce the tree plan from the substantive provisions uh, of the act. The details of administration it could be, but basically you're going to have to have a tree plan in order to be able to enforce the substance and provisions of the bylaw. Okay. And Mr. Chair, I believe you added I put it, I put the, wrong the language. Place, I? Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Looks good. Okay. It's on to number 11. So 11, 12, and 13 are all requests to waive fees, and we are just denying those. And they have not objected in the prior set of comments, which brings us to number 14. Um, request waiver of various unspecified definitions. The applicant has not submitted sufficient information to the board to make an informed decision, so we're waiving. We are denying the waiver. Um, 15. Um, so the waiver granted to allow construction is shown on the approved plans. Um, 
I'm not sure why I put for discussion. I don't know if there's any real discussion about that. I think this just can't proceed unless we It's 15, 16, uh, it's use regulations, waiver denied is unnecessary. There's a comprehensive permit, subsumes all of their local permitting processes. The applicant is not required to obtain a special permit for the project since the applicant is detailed. No substantive waivers of the these sec sections that are necessary, waiver request is denied. Use. Uh, waiver request 17, uh, dens density and dimensional regulation section, and it's basically just sort of a blanket request. Um, so this waiver is denied. The board addresses the more specific waiver requests below. So 18. Uh, request a waiver front yard, side yard setback under section 628, requiring a 25 foot setback for each front yard setback proposed to the town. Homes on Dorothy Road at 20 feet and the southwest corner of the senior residential building. Rear yard setback is 18.7 feet from the lot line due to the odd configuration of the property lines. No adjacent buildable property is impacted by the rear yard. And it says rear year. So we're changing year to yard, setback waiver, um, waiver granted to allow construction shown on the approved plans. Um, 19, uh, building in floodplains, no substantive waivers requested. Uh, waiver. can, yes, please. Excuse me, going back to the last one. Yeah. Just so we're not missing anything, they're probably missing several other zoning um, parameters in there besides setbacks, like free space, et cetera. Do we know if they've got the 25 foot free space in their lots, et cetera? The open space is, is waiver number 20. Oh, okay. And there's, uh, yeah. And then I believe they meet the height requirements. Yeah, they met height, they met floor area ratio, and there should be one for parking, um, both for the uh, number of spaces provided for the multifamily building and uh, some of the townhouses are only getting one space instead of the two that were required in 2016. Yep. Special permit, this one is is denied as unnecessary because they don't need to obtain a special permit because they're getting a comprehensive permit. Um, number 20 is the open space regulations. Section sets forth a minimum requirement of 10% landscape and 10% usable open space for apartments in the PUD zoning district. The applicant requests a waiver to allow for less than 10% usable open space. Um, and then so the applicant had, to, the, the waiver needs to be granted, but the applicant has agreed to set aside 12 of the 17.7 .7 acres as open space in lieu of strict adherence to the 10% usable open space requirement, as that term may narrowly be construed under the bylaw. So I guess it's a question as to whether we want to consider the rest of the lot and the, the, of which we, you know, we don't fully understand what the disposition of those 12 acres are really going to be in the end, who's going to be taking them over, who's going to be responsible for them, yeah. et cetera. Do we want to put that second sentence in, or do we just want to say that the waiver is granted? Mr. Chairman, my recommendation is just to leave it at waiver granted. I agree. I agree with that too. I'm oh, sorry. So leave it as is or just as waiver granted? Leave it at waiver granted. Okay. Perfect. Okay. So 21 was one that they got stuck in a little later. It's about the sign permitting. 
Um, and so this is one we had discussed at the previous hearing. Uh, the board would actually waiver granted only to allow the applicant one ground sign not to exceed 24 square feet. They had requested four by six. Um, and one canopy side sign not to exceed the size of the face of the proposed entry canopy. Uh, directional and other signs to be limited to two square feet per sign because the bylaw only allows one square foot per sign. Any questions with that one? No. 22, uh, off street parking, the amount of parking proposed by the applicant was deemed appropriate by the peer review engineer. So that was added by, maybe that was added by the applicant. Parking spaces, less than Oh, wait a second. Sorry, my number is off on this one. Yeah. So the last sentence there was added um, by the applicant. Um, I don't know if we want to retain that in the waiver request. Mr. Chairman, if you do want to retain it, I would actually bring it down to the next section after waiver granted. Hmm. That's really a justification for the granting. Okay. Not, not really describing the waiver that's requested. Right. And Mr. Chairman, I don't even know why we need, would need to retain it, frankly. I'm fine with that as well. Yeah. And then this is a good place. I think we had discussed, as Mr. Mills noted, that or Mr. Evelyn had noted that they were requesting two additional park, they needed two additional parking waivers um, in regards to the duplex units. Not tau. Let's go with two. Mr. Chair, I believe that's toe. <laughs> <laughs> that is one of my common mistypings. In addition, two of the duplex units shall be allowed to have one parking space only. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Hanlon. Um, I would, the description of the application, uh, the description of the request for a waiver doesn't yeah. refer to these two duplex units. No. Um, it's, I don't remember exactly which document or which statement it was which, where it was added, but it seems to me that in order to, that we shouldn't just sort of grant a waiver that as far as we've indicated hasn't been asked for. Right. So I would, we would, I think we should probably uh, put in the, in the heading that they've asked for uh, the two, you know, the, the two cases in which they have only one parking space, and then we can just grant it. Okay. Uh, looking back at my notes from the last hearing uh, for waiver 22, Ms. Kiefer requests the language include a statement about the duplex parking. Uh, there were two parking spaces required in 2016. And some of the units will have only one space. And duplex units will only be required to provide one. She said the two. That seem fair. Yes. 
I'm going fine with that. 23 parking loading space standards limit the number of compact spaces to 20% applicants requesting a waiver to allow approximately 25%. Um, and again, waiver granted to allow construction is shown on the approved plans and that's basically because of the way they are doing the parking underneath the, uh, the building posts in the basement level parking. Brings us to number 24. Article 10, section 10.2. <clears throat> section prohibits permits from being issued to structures that do not comply with the substantive provisions of zoning bylaws. Uh, waiver granted to allow construction is shown on the approved plans. Straight forward. Next one, 25. That's for special permit review requirements for the board or the Arlington Redevelopment Board. It's Arlington Redevelopment Authority. RB. No, that's right. This board limits the duration of the special permits to two years. Staff can request a waiver of the procedural requirements for special permits. Also, request a waiver of the two year lapse provision. Waiver denied is unnecessary because comprehensive permit subsumes all other local permitting. Waiver of the special permits are required. The board grants the substantive waiver of the two year lapse provision contained in section 1011 so that the comprehensive permit shall lapse if substantial use is not commenced within three years as set forth in the regulation. Any questions with that one? I think that's <clears throat> straightforward. Uh, next one, 26 under variances. Uh, waiver denied is unnecessary. Applicant is not required to obtain variances as a part of comprehensive permit application. The provisions are not applicable. Uh, 27, um, floodplain district, special permit requirement for uses within the floodplain. Waiver denied is unnecessary. The applicant is not required to obtain waivers of special permit requirements as all other local permits are subsumed. And then the same with the inland wetland district, um, the same response. 29, um, I was just gonna wreck up, and they were just to, just to clarify this D4, D5 and D6. Um, and then E and F under EDR, but then again, the waiver is denied as unnecessary. The applicant is not required to obtain waivers on procedural requirements for special permits. Um, and then substantive waiver for temporary, I don't know why that's here. Oh, the applicant also requests a substantive waiver of the signage requirement to allow for temporary construction signage is allowed by the building inspector. I, I don't see why that would be required. I think they're required to do, I think they're allowed to have signage with or without EDR. Thirty, the affordable housing requirements. Um, And request a waiver to allow compliance with the requirements of the subsidizing agency. Yeah, so that's granted. So it does indicate that it's because of the subsidizing agency that it's being granted. So that's fine. Um, and then 31, uh, copies of permit regulations, request a waiver to allow for an application does not. So this is from our own permit, special permit regulations. Um, And it's in regards to what they're supposed to be providing in terms of the documentation. And essentially they have provided us the documentation. If we feel they provided the documentation we need to, to uh, decide on the application, then the waiver uh, is fine. So are there any other questions on these? I know there was one I was gonna be looking up um, and I believe there was one that Pat was going to be following up on. Yeah, I think Pat is following up on number six. Um, uh, 
Uh, there is one. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I did Mr. DuPont, you first. All right, I'll go ahead. <laughs> uh, so I, um, I do have Ms. Kiefer asking for a verbal waiver of hours to allow work from 7.30 to 4.30. Um, but, you know, perhaps that's something we address in condition in the conditions section. Right. The town bylaws, the noise by ordinance allows from eight to six. Mm -hmm. And we had the sort of a long discussion about starting a little earlier at 730 and, you know, kind of we went back and forth between various end times. And I don't remember exactly if we ended up at 430 or 530, but, um, you know, they were requesting um, an adjustment there. Right. So, Paul, where the town bylaws include a provision for uh, essentially a provision for construction hours for exterior work. Do if if we're looking to limit those to different hours, do we need to put down a waiver? It would be preferable to make it clear that a waiver has been granted. I'll, let me see if I can find it in the bylaw, town bylaws. Okay, so I believe it is Title V, Article 12. That's titled Noise? Title, titled Noise Abatement. If I say waiver granted is conditioned by the board, then we can, in our conditions, we can give a specific time. And I think that. Mr. Chairman. Yes, please. Just suggest that when we, when we go back over this, eventually we'll have a condition that will relate to this in some way, which may or may not actually involve a change in the noise regime. Uh, we haven't really decided what to do. And I didn't think that the neighbors were unanimous on that either. Um, but here, I think that we could simply say that uh, this is granted to allow the compliance with condition something or other, and then we should specify what the condition is. But we don't know that now because we haven't done it yet. Okay. Those are the waivers. So I'll go ahead, I'll clean this up and then we can come back. Um, I'll clean this up and then get this back out to everybody. Look back over.
that. Too far. Okay. Okay. Nine o'clock. Um, should we go to nine thirty and then call it a night? All right. So I think these first few conditions are really straightforward and are just uh, anyone has any specific things? Um, did add under the essentially what is the site the site drawings there's an unnumbered document called the potential conservation parcel um, which we've added in document that pinch should be a limited entity consists of not more than 12 duplex ownership units contained within six duplex structures. Twelve duplex ownership units. Twelve ownership units contained within six duplex structures together with 124 units in your residential apartment units. There's no more than 12 four bedroom duplex ownership units. Let me come back to this because there, there's not 12 duplex ownership units. There's 12, 12 ownership units in six duplexes. So come back and take a look at that again. Um, Mr. Chair? Yes, please. It's a small procedural, if you will, formatting issue. Sometimes we repeat numbers as spelling them out and the numerics, and sometimes we don't. It just seems very inconsistent in the formatting. Okay. I don't know if we want to uh, adopt one format or another consistently. And some of these we have 124 dash units, some of these have 24. I can see the three digit ones, but you yeah. know, we have a lot of two digit ones that are spelled out and not spelled out. I don't know if there's any rationale in the formatting. Well, actually, with that particular one, I think it should read A with A124 dash unit. Yes, you're living A124 unit apartment building consisting of, and then would we do 58? Mr. Chairman? Yep. Um, you know, I, I hate to, to descend from the consensus of my profession, but I've always thought that that I don't think there's any danger that anyone is going to misread that 58 and doing and making the repetition doesn't seem to me to be advantageous. So, you know, I, I would just go with using using all one or the other, but I, I prefer to use the number just because it's easier to read and is clearer. 
I agree with Pat. Just a formatting issue and consistency. Yeah. As long as we spell the numbers correctly. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we're going with not spelling the, the numbers, right? That's right. Right. But if you so spell you one, know. you want to spell one twelve, one two, and not say two three because your fingers. Went. Yeah. Anyway, this is this is fine. <laughs> All right. so like I agree with Mr. Hanlon. Okay. Um, next, the 95 vehicle parking spaces, inclusive of the required handicap spaces for senior living apartment building. Duplex will have driveway parking for two vehicles per dwelling unit, with the exception of the end units, with one parking space to the side rear of the duplex unit. So that was the one we just added the exception to cover. Um, the waiver list attached to it. So says here that the waiver list is attached as exhibit A, but it's not actually labeled exhibit A. Um, I'll just leave it as attached here too. Seems right. This report is granted. Otherwise, that's pretty much boilerplate seven. Plans in the 45 day period for review. <clears throat> Premises transferred. Ready to conference of binding of assessors. Well, limited dividend restriction shall apply to the owner of the product regardless of sale, transfer, assignment of the property. Provided the regulatory agreement with the subsidizing agency is not otherwise expired. Okay, there. A ten. So the cons. Yeah, we go with sidewalks. The sidewalks, driveways, roads, utility, and all other on-site infrastructure on the approved plans, except in the existing service. As serving the project shall remain private in perpetuity and the town shall not have now or in the future any legal responsibility for the operation or maintenance of the infrastructure. Um, so I think the question that was being raised so the sidewalks that are on the public way um, We need to treat them differently. Well, I guess if the sidewalks were in the public way, would they be considered on site? That's a good question. Mr. Haverty, you have a view, I wonder? And I don't believe they would. It specifically limits us to on-site infrastructure. Okay. Yes, yeah, so I can't. I just can't remember if the sidewalk on Dorothy, if it's technically on their property or if it's still within the right of way. But I guess if it's, if it's far enough back that it's on their property, then it's on-site. It doesn't matter. That's all section A, which is- well, Mr. Chairman? Yes, Mr. Hanlon. Um, I'm a little nervous about in, in A10, it is recognized that the storm drain, storm drain easement running out of the site and the existing sewer easement are the legal obligation of the town to remain. Um, I don't think that we have the authority to concede anything on behalf of the town. Uh, I don't know whether that's true or not. I assume it is, but I- Wonder whether it's necessary for us to uh, uh, for us to do that. It, 
in, in general, I think that things in the conditions that purport to propose to pose obligations on anything, anyone other than the applicant are probably inappropriate. Uh, and it's sort of as sort of an extension to that, recognizing a proposition of what our legal obligations are without thorough study at least, uh, doesn't seem like something that we need to or should do. I agree with that, Mr. Chairman. Same. Thank you, Mr. Hamlin. Absolutely. Any other questions on the A's? That one out. Accept these. One last look at that wording, see if I want to propose the next one. All right, brings on to section B on affordability. Uh, Ms. Kiefer's comment, uh, Mass Housing is charged with the programmatic aspects of the project. Additional conditioning may inadvertently be viewed as overstepping the role of the ZBA. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I don't think that this is overstepping. It's simply noting what the board is presuming the subsidizing agency will require, and then presuming that it does, requiring them to share copies with the board. Okay. That works. Um... was from uh, I I that is my comment I um, took that language from the 1165 R decision okay you know, should be maintained as affordable in perpetuity which for the purpose of the decision shall mean as long as property is not comply with applicable zoning or other local requirements without the benefit of the conference permit and that is exactly what we had on 1165 R Three approval of the agency of fair market plan. So, um, so this is the local preference question. So, at um, you know, this the board may impose up to I think it's up to seventy percent for local preference, where the the board can uh, limit occupancy to. Um, specific classes of people um, based on their residence in the town or they're working for the town. And we had decided at 1165R not to impose that um, to allow for the, a greater pool of applicants for the affordable units. And I uh, believe that the, so the question then before the board is, do we want to adopt that same posture here or do we want to uh, um, impose a, a local preference. Chairman? Mr. Hanlon. Um, in, I think in essential respects, this is the in the same position and covered by the same rationale as 1165R. Uh, it, it may actually even be stronger here because the I'm guessing, and I wouldn't rely on this particularly, but I'm guessing the older population of Arlington is even more racially homo homogeneous than the than than the population as a whole, but in any event, uh, you know you're still you're still looking at restricting the pool of people from whom you are taking applicants to uh, a population that has been affected by segregation, intentional and unintentional, for many many years, and we should we should just not continue doing that. Any further questions on that or any of the other Section B requests? Okay. 
submission requirements. So this is one that, again, uh, there are some requests in here from the Conservation Commission and data in regards to the ones that are under their jurisdiction or would typically be under their jurisdiction. Um, and Here. Um, so again, this is just the like that ought to be a in there. I'll fix the numbering. Um, that the board to review final engineering drawings and plans, such a cool the purpose that purpose of this provision is to ensure the final plans are indeed final. If the Conservation Commission requires changes to the plans as part of the WPA process, those changes have to be included on the final plans. Final plans should also incorporate all relevant conditions herein and requirements not otherwise waived by this decision of the permitting agencies having jurisdiction. See, it's time to have 45 days. I, I believe the, on the 1165R, there was a question about whether the town had to just respond within 45 days or whether they had to, um, whether they just had to acknowledge that they'd received them within 45 days. I can't, I think that's elsewhere in the, <coughs> In the conditions. Uh, so there's this section here uh, submit to the board for administrative approval landscaping plan with the final plans and substantial conformance with the planting plan, including the plan signed and sealed by a registered landscape architect, depicting the following. Um, so this is very typical of just sort of the general lands, you know, the, the, the landscaping around the building. But the Conservation Commission had um, in their letter of October 14th had recommended another section. Um, so they have a landscape plan, which is more towards um, what's governed under section 24 of the wetland regulations. Uh, and so it's, it's a, I'm not sure if we should have two landscape sections, one for this <laughs> or about the, for the, the regular landscaping and then a separate one for the landscaping that falls under the wetland regulations or what people think we might wanna do. Mr. Chairman. Hanlon. Um, it seems to me that if we tried to combine them, it would be it would end up being confusing. Um, and uh, assuming uh, my recollection and, and Mr. Revelex's recollection is always better than mine on figuring out what happened at a previous hearing, but my recollection is that the thrust of the Conservation Commission had to do with the work uh, that particularly I, I thought it was focused on the construction that would happen in providing the compensatory storage, but more generally mm -hmm. the re-vegetation that's necessary after that. Um, in any event, there's some distinction between the two and I just, you can solve that problem to a degree to just qualify one as sort of an on-site landscaping plan or some verbal formula that, says that this is what it relates to and then the other one uh, to uh, talk about a wetlands one or some other uh, phrase that that modifies it so it's you know landscaping plan a and landscaping plan b and the task is just to figure out what 
just to what the actual words are for for a and b and then you can separate them out but then it, but it will always be clear because the title of the section will be different as to what's required all right so one this one here is substantively uh areas that are outside of the uh, wetlands resource areas so that might be a reasonable way to do it so this is for areas outside the wetland resource areas and then the the language that was provided by the Conservation Commission, we could consider for areas within the resource areas. For be just a because this discussion came up earlier or at a prior hearing, um, we may want to the the there was the issue of whether or not the term resource area includes adjacent upland resource areas. Ah. Um, so we may want to. We may we may need to wordsmith it a little differently, like saying BVW, IVW, an area devoted to comp compensatory flood storage or lands ordinarily under the jurisdiction of the Conservation Commission or um, I'm ordering sure land Mr. subject to flooding and the aura. Any Possibly. one of those, sex, those types of OK. Because at least the proposal by the by the uh, commission, um, I'm not sure what he in the in the lead-in paragraph it says. Given the extent of vegetation proposed to be removed within a resource area, comma here BLSF and aura, and parenthesis, the applicant shall provide a landscape plan as provided in section 24. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know exactly what the word here means, uh, but that does sort of specify which which things they're they're treating as resource areas for purposes of of this. I don't know if it makes sense to say a section twenty four landscape plan or some use that as a way of describing it. It's a little bit tricky. Land under the jurisdiction of section twenty four in area of land not under that jurisdiction of section 24. Mr. Haverty, do you think that would work? I think that would be fine. Mr. Chairman, yeah. just as we go through this, we're doing a fair amount of uh, addressing this. I, I don't want to say on the on the fly, although it sort of is on the fly. But uh, as we think through the solutions to these problems, I'm kind of hoping that at the very end we we just have a read through. Uh, Perhaps Mr. Haverty can do that just to reconcile things. And there will certainly be things that will be off and astray because we're essentially doing this by committee. Um, and you know, I'm I'm beginning to have this feeling that that once we look at back at it as a whole, there'll be some various bits of ironing that need to be done to make it all fit together properly. Yeah. And so certainly what I can do here with you know with the with the waivers and then with the conditions will we get to this evening i can clean those up so that um those can be distributed back out to the board that would be very much appreciated mr chair thank you absolutely So, this, so, yeah, so this year section D will be the landscape plan and then I will insert uh, the language from the Conservation Commission for the following hearing. Um, 
And then here, the applicant must provide a compensatory flood storage mitigation plan, the okay. proposed compensatory flood storage area to mitigate the negative impacts. So the veteran reduced removal. This is the one that had initially, I think was initially proposed by the Conservation Commission um, and had was originally in the finding section Then we moved it down here. Um, so I've taken that language and then there is further language in the uh, the October 14 letter from the Conservation Commission, which is then incorporated into here. So the goal is to provide a temporary storage area for flood water, as well as provide important wildlife habitat functions, including important food source, shelter, migratory, or overwintering areas, breeding areas for wildlife. This flood storage area shall rectify the current adverse impact of the floodplain by providing a better replacement resource area. Said so mitigation plan should provide the following. Um, so their recommendation was to change to an 80% survival rate throughout, which we've made the change. Um, as uh, Mr. Hanlon had recommended for 1165R, um, there's the standard here of the American Association of Nurserymen, and then he had provided language in case the American Association of Nurserymen goes under what that means in that case, so that's in here. Um, a monitor report should be submitted to the ZBA annually in June during the three-year monitoring period. Uh, and then, so these sections in red were from the original, but then they were not included in the most recent letter from the Conservation Commission. Um, I just wanted to get the board sense as to whether they wanted to maintain those or remove them. And then the, so the I think that was number uh, six and seven. And then number eight. Um, so uh, Mr. Fuchs had submitted a letter uh, to the original April one and uh, the Mystic River Watershed Association had similarly submitted letters um, looking towards longer term um, invasive plant management and reporting. And so basically that we, you know, if things are still not working out after three years that they continue their efforts. But if they, if things have worked over after three years then they can remain. Mr. Chairman. Yes. I'm not clear what the difference is between number seven and number eight. The survivorship and health is different, is distinct from the invasive species management goals. Both of them are dealing with what happens if it if, if goals aren't met in the third year. Mm -hmm. um, if eight just adds an additional goal that is, I mean, I'm not sure whether yeah. plant survivorship and health substantively is more, is as a practical matter equivalent to target invasive species management goals. But if it is, then we already have it. And if it isn't, we could expand a little bit to put it within the structure we've got already. Right. So this section is, yeah, compensatory storage mitigation is, so this, this is not the invasive plant management plan, which is a different plan. Yeah. So maybe removing eight would not be detrimental to anything. I mean, I, I see them and, you know, I, this is, I have a, I have, I'm completely have a completely lay person's view of this, but uh, survival ship rate for the planting plan means you want the new plants to grow and invasives means you, you want the invasives to stay away. <laughs> right. um, I, I think they're two different things with two different courses of action. Um, mm -hmm. And if we do, and if we do have another section devoted to invasive species management, then, you know, perhaps five, six, seven, eight, eight mm -hmm. could, uh, you know, is, is not worth retaining. Okay. 
trying to remember if the invasive plan is in here or if it didn't make it in yet. Mr. Chairman. Yes. I'm a little worried about um, having the same problem we had with the landscape plan that you have something that relates to the compensatory um, the compensatory uh, flood storage and then something else that deals more broadly and that if we exclude it here there's we're, I'm afraid that we might be introducing a gap because the one doesn't completely cover the other and they need to be there to be complementary even though the substance of obligation is similar um, and I don't I mean I it seems to me we need to take a look at that and make sure that that the two provisions would fit together properly and in particular whether the invasive species plan is going to cover the compensatory storage construction right so the the invasive species management plan language is actually under i-28 um and i think that's because this section here here is prior to any construction or site development activities. Uh, oh, so uh, okay. So this is these are just submission requirements. These are submission requirements. Which says release the question that. You know these other portions that are going to occur afterwards. Do they re should they be here or should they be elsewhere? Or well, we actually, could could you scroll up? I think it said that these are the. It looks like this section is basically a list of what has to be in the mitigation plan. Yeah. So it's not a requirement to actually do it. It's a requirement to put it in a plan. Correct. Okay. Okay. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Uh, going back up to three, um, it makes a specification. No, yeah, only native non-cultivated species shall be planted on the site. Yeah, um, I would suggest taking out the non-cultivated. I, I would encourage non-cultivated species to be specified. Did you want the non-cultivar in or out? In. In. more likely to be beneficial to wildlife. Cultivators can be uh, um, less uh, beneficial for wildlife being bred for one thing or another, size, shape, color. Okay, so I remember we had gone back and forth on this a bit at 1165, trying to determine which was the right way to go. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Hanlon. In 1165, we followed the recommendation of the Conservation Commission, which is the recommendation here is to uh, not include the non cultivar species. But, uh, and I think that the language we have here might be taken from 1165. I'm not sure, but it looks familiar. Okay. Um, you know, it, The two are, are obviously different situations, and and there was a special reason in 1165 is it was it was difficult to with 1165 with the way in which they were moving the stream, mm -hmm. um, it was difficult for the specific plan that the conservation commission had approved to be done, and at the same time prohibit. Uh, or to uh, the, the cultivar species. Uh, we don't really have a similar situation here. Uh, okay. So if it's the sense of the board, the Conservation Commission isn't insisting on it here, but if it's the sense of the board uh, that we should do what Mr. Mills suggests, I don't think that would be inconsistent with the 1165 uh, decision. It, it just has a different, there's, there are different facts there. I, I do remember that with 1165, it was basically we, we wanted to ensure that uh, the decision permitted the applicants to plant as according to the plans the Conservation Commission had approved.
Okay. This is a storm of mitigation. Let's see quickly. Yeah, so in, in the language from the Conservation Commission, um, they did not include non cultivar. Under this section, they only said only native species shall be planted on site to establish ground cover and native woody shrubs and trees. Mr. Chairman, that it would that would be fine with me. I don't really care actually on, on this one. <laughs> I, I just want to, you know, it's whatever the board comes up with. It's it's yeah. not something that I think is is goes to the heart of the matter. Okay. So, Mr. Mills, if the Conservation Commission left non cultivar out, are you comfortable taking it out as well, or do you want to still leave it? Um, I want to leave it in, to tell you the truth. Okay. Let's do it. All right. Um, I do believe later on in the document, it refers to using non-cultivar species. That may very well be. Mr. Chairman, yep. I'm, I'm drawing a blank here, but what we're doing is saying what should be in, in a plan. Correct. Um, and I'm trying to remember, in each case, is there a substantive condition later on saying the applicant has to comply with the plan? We should make sure that there is. I don't want to just assume that because they have a plan, they have they, they're legally obligated to follow it without making sure that's right. Should we have that? Um, it's the director of plan community development construction mitigation plan, which is dust control measure. So th there's a separate condition that deals with that's the construction management plan, which needs to be coordinated with the uh, building department and requires a public meeting. And so I was recommending say we say, well, it'd be better, even better with a verb. Uh, this is separate from the construction management plan required by condition D2. Let's make sure that we have that included. Uh, other than, and uh, Mr. Havity, uh, we can we can say they have to submit things to like the director of planning who could meet community development. That's okay to require, right? That they don't have to do it necessarily through us. That is correct. In, in fact, the HAC decision law makes it clear that that's the preferred approach. Okay. This is the review of the final plans by the uh, Department of Planning and Community Development. So does the, so this doesn't ref, this references the planning it doesn't reference inspectional services in the in this final in this review of the final plans um, but I think this is just for conformance with this decision and then the inspectional services would review them to issue a building permit is that correct Mr. Haverty so what was that Mr. Chairman so this paragraph G yep. talks about Submission to Department of Planning and Community uh, Planning and Community Development and their review for conformance. Um, but this doesn't impact inspectional services 
requirement to still review the plans before issuance of a building permit, correct? Absolutely correct. Okay. The building permit process is 100% different than the final approval process. It's done under state law. It's not part of the comprehensive permit process. And they have to complete this process before they're able to go and file their permit. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Final plans will be in substantial compliance. This should be sufficient. I have to include final design and details of the proposed roof storm water storage system. Final plan shall show designated snow storage areas consistent with the area shown on the approved plans. Location of all utilities, including but not limited to electric telephone and cable, should be shown on the final plans. All transformers and other electrical and telecommunication system components shall be included on the final plans. Final plans shall provide for the relocation of an existing utility pole presently located in the area of the proposed driveway for duplex units three and four. Applicants should also coordinate with the utility company to relocate the pole. Uh, applicant must provide notification to the Arlington Assessor's Office for address and unit numbering. Uh, submit to the board for its administrative approval, uh, sign plans and details consistent with the sign information shown on the approved plans and descriptions provided within the hearing. Signage to include ground sign at the main access drive. Additional wayfinding signage to direct residents or guests to parking garage in the main entrance and a canopy sign on the senior living building. Proposed signage to be depicted on final plans. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Um, on this last one, I have a little bit of a problem with saying description provided within the hearing. Okay. Um, and I think if we know what that description is, we should substitute it in here. Okay. Uh, otherwise, it would be extremely difficult for. I mean, what is what is anyone going to do? Is go back and look up ACMI to find the right place in the hearing? It it's not really very enforceable. So I think now is the time to get clear on just what that description is and just put it into the condition. Okay. I'll include that because they they had indicated they were going to do a twenty four square foot ground sign. Um, a canopy sign the size of the canopy and the two square foot per sign uh, per sign yeah yeah and I think they did it all in one spot so it's, it's easy just to figure out what it is okay update that um, so we can either go on to the last part of C or if you want we can break now and pick this up again our next session. I'm okay with picking up with C2 at the next session. Okay. okay. Agreed. Agreed. Looks like it'll go fast anyway. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, could you go back up to E uh, with the small Roman numerals, six, seven, eight, just quickly. I just wanted to, so you, you've uh, crossed out eight and, you know, Mm -hmm. Sort of relative to the comment that uh, Mr. Reverend made about those are only saying what needed to be included in the plan. Mm -hmm. It's not actually imposing an obligation on them to do that, just to include it in the plan. So right. I, I wasn't clear. Are you thinking that eight is so different that it should be deleted from this? Or are you going to treat so, six, seven, and eight the same? So I think eight is supposed to be a part of the invasive species management plan, not okay. a part of the uh, the landscape plan. Okay, great. I just wanted to clarify. Yeah. Thank you. All right. So with that, I will go ahead. I will um, clean up the parts that we have reviewed tonight and get those back out to people. Um, Paul, are those things that should get posted to the website as well, or at least to the agenda? Is that, Mr. Chairman? Um, so the revisions that we're making sort of day to day here, if I reissue them to the board, should they be posted to the public as well? They should, yes. Okay. 
Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Should there be some sort of a notice that 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 these are not? I mean, this, these are not final decisions. Our part in yeah. in two for two reasons. One is that we haven't made a decision and won't until the very end as to whether to adopt any of this. But also the way in which we're going about it is somewhat tentative and we're and subject to to or th rethinking and fine tuning later on in, in this process. And I guess I'm sort of interested in being able to make it in that it'd be clear to anybody in the public looking at this that they shouldn't treat it as more firm than it is. Okay. One thing, Mr. Chairman, you can do is actually put a watermark on the draft decision, labeling it as a draft. Okay. Good suggestion. I personally like using different colors, but I don't think many people follow me in that. All right. So with that then, um, our next meeting is scheduled for Wednesday, November 3rd at 7.30. So you're looking for a motion to continue tonight's deliberation until Wednesday, November 3rd. 3rd, 2021 at 7.30 p.m. So moved. Second. Second. Uh, vote of the board. Uh, Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Mills? Aye. Mr. O'Rourke? Aye. Mr. Revelak? Aye. Board? Aye. And the chair votes aye. So we are continued until Wednesday, November 3rd. And with that, we can take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. A second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Mills. Um, go to the board, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mills. Aye. Mr. O'Rourke. Aye. Revelac. Aye. Board. Aye. The chair votes aye. We are adjourned. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good night, Mr. Chairman. Thank you so much.